Hello and welcome to the Spiraling Higher podcast hosted by me, Sam, Mindset and Manifestation Coach. And me, Gina, your Biz and Mindset Coach. We're here to support you on your spiritual journey by bringing you intimate and raw conversations about healing, manifestation, consciousness, and spirituality. We hope this podcast makes you feel less alone as you become aware of your patterns and limiting beliefs to uplevel your life, manifest like a boss, and together, spiral higher. Spiralers, prepare yourselves for the crossover that you did not know that you needed between us and the incredible personality and host behind the Skinny Dipping Podcast, Miss Kayla Rose. Welcome! Welcome! Oh my gosh. <laughs> guys, I'm so excited. I'm, I'm pretty sure you guys are my two favorite people on the internet. I'm not going to lie. Oh my like, gosh. Uh, because <laughs> you're definitely every time mine. you guys say things… I'm like, every time you say anything, I'm just like, wait, the collective energy is so real. I'm experiencing that exact same realization. And I'm just like, how special is it that we haven't even met in real life, but we get to all almost continue on the same frequency to carry out a certain mission. Like, we don't know exactly what that mission looks like, but I know that we are kind of all on a similar mission and it just feels like so special. So, so special. So special. I definitely want to say to you that before we ever co-created the first time when I first saw your content, it was like the most beautiful mirror for me that, oh my God, there are actually so many more people than I realized who were already waking up to this and le- integrating this and teaching this and holding spaces for this. It was like confirmation for me that I was on the right path. And so to be here co-creating with you again for a second time just feels so divine. Um, if our listeners are not familiar with your incredible energy already, I would love for you to tell them a little bit about yourself, what you're moving through right now so that we can get to start moving around yes. and sharing all the energy that we built up before we started recording. <laughs> oh my gosh. I'm so excited to just get into it, honestly, to just talk about the philosophy and the intention behind everything that we're all currently experiencing. And I'm Kayla Rose. I'm the podcast host of Skinny Dipping, where we dive into the mind, the body, and the soul in order to create actionable change in our lives. And what I really try to do with Skinny Dipping is to move past the theoretical, which I also, I love talking about the theoretical, and I'm sure we'll get into so much of that today. But I love to ask the question, okay, but like, what's the action behind it? What's Mm -hmm. the physicality behind it? How do we actually transmute this knowledge into action? Because Mm -hmm. I think that's where... Some people just get lost. That's where I get lost. So that's where I wanted to kind of like fit in and help with within this big world of, I don't want to say self-improvement because I feel like that's just assuming something is like inherently wrong with us. And that's Mm -hmm. the exact opposite of what I like to teach. I like to teach that we are literally inherently worthy. Absolutely. And it's not even a teaching, but it's a remembering because when people hear that, they feel this deep knowing in them. Like, damn, no, I actually knew that. Like, I actually knew that I was already inherently worthy. And when someone said it to me, the first time somebody said it to me personally, I had this deep remembering where I was like, oh, I actually remember that. Mm -hmm. I remember I've just forgotten because of all these layers upon layers within, within society that have told me, oh, I'm not good enough. You need to produce. You need to, you know, you need to create this. You need to make money to be worthy. Just all these different things that are put upon us. And I just wanted to come into this space and be like, okay, like let's, let's talk about it, but then let's actually figure out how to make it applicable. Like, Mm -hmm. you know what I mean? Like, it just feels so good. That's what I love about you guys. Cause you guys take complicated concepts and break them down in a way. I I usually call it like chewable vitamins. That's when I first started skinny (laughs) dipping. That's like really what I dove into was like, okay, like I want to make it like a chewable vitamin where it's like somebody can take this and it is tasty and it is easy and it is, you know, it's not hard to swallow. Bite it's size. Like, <laughs> it's bite size. Yeah. So I love that's what you guys do as well. I feel like you take complicated concepts and you break them down so that the the humanity in us can understand. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. I mean, yeah. I think we're all the three of us extremely aligned with the understanding that awareness does not equal change. I remember when my coach first told me, awareness just equals awareness. That's it. There is a very different pathway that has to be formed within our brain for us to go from awareness to change. And so I'm actually kind of curious, what is something that you were only once aware of that you've now begun to integrate the change? 
That is such a good question. And I literally love that because I think this was the year of integration for me. I, before 2023, I had been on my mental health, spiritual journey. I use them cohesively because for me, they really did happen at the same time in Mm -hmm. harmony. And I had been on that journey for about four, five years. And so I finally began to integrate the change that I had learned about for so long. And the biggest thing that I saw myself integrate this year was letting go of the need to be productive. Like I was saying Mm -hmm. earlier, I knew that for so long. Like I had literally heard the saying, you are inherently worthy. You are a human being, not a human doing. Like all these little taglines that I had in my head that I was kind of reprogramming my brain with. I kept telling myself those things for years and years and years, but still I came back to not surrendering and instead being in the seat of the controller and trying to control yeah. everything rather than sitting back and be an observer. Mm-hmm. And this year, the main things that I've integrated is, oh my gosh, so much allowance to rest deeper, like to rest, to, to allow myself to move in cycles. I never used to move in cycles. I used to just push and push and push through slow periods and not give myself the rest that my body was craving and begging for. And what I realized is, no, I am literally this human being, especially as a woman who is on this infridian rhythm yep. in this 28 day, in this 28 day cycle, I work with the seasons. Nothing is in bloom hundred percent of the time and neither am I. And I actually see myself allowing myself periods of rest without, without the judgment, without the shame mm-hmm. in a way that I never had before. And it's something that just happened. It just happened. Like it just happened after the years of work and continuing, continuously integrating And then it just happened. And the other thing that I noticed that I integrated is I actually don't take what people say to me personally anymore. I had Mm. heard that for so long. You know, I read the four agreements. We all (laughs) all read the four agreements. It's like, don't take shit personally. And I'm like, okay, I get it. I get it. I get it. I did not get it. I took everything personally, especially (laughs) my close friends. Like I would literally take it everything so to heart. And this is the first year that I realized, oh my God, like literally somebody acting a certain way towards me is not a reflection of me. It's not a reflection of my worth. And I'm actually an embodying it. I'm not just saying it or realizing it or having, like you said, awareness of it. I'm actually using my responses as this ability for me to tell that I've changed. My responses yes. are different. I'm no longer reacting. When someone treats me a certain way, I'm not like, oh my God, I need to scramble and make sure that things are better between us. I need to work this out immediately. I need to have this urgency because I'm realizing that urgency is literally a trauma response. Yes. That has been yep. coming through for me yes. so intensely. And now I'm just like, wait, I can take a pause and take take a moment and come back to this at a different time because actually most of the time, it doesn't have to do with me. Like it really doesn't. It like never it really does. doesn't. And it's so beautiful. Like I feel so free in a way that I never have before because I'm actually not taking things personally. But that's something that took literally four years to integrate. Like I read mm. that book. I heard it a million times. I relearned it a million times. And then it finally came to this point where it was just like, oh my God, I'm responding differently. I'm not reacting anymore. I'm responding. Mm-hmm. So yeah, I don't know. I don't know about you guys, but that I just realized what people think about me is none of my fucking business. <laughs> well, yeah, I think 100%. That, that both of those themes have been very alive. And I think in both of our lives this past year, for sure, especially the gearing down of the hustle and that productivity and that pushing. And um, I, I heard this somewhere that the only things that kind of just keep growing and never stop are actually very destructive. Um, and it's like the forest fires. Yeah. Never or stop. Like weeds. Just keeps on growing. Or cancer. Yeah. Weeds. Right. Oh just keeps yeah, on growing. Yeah. Weeds. Yes. And so to ignore the natural nature of things seems so insane, but it's because so much of the rest of the world is operating under that manual. And so I think that was the hardest thing is, yes, you might decide to start gearing down and start to not care about what other people think or start to, you know, allow yourself to rest. But when everybody around you is not operating like that and you look like the odd one out, it's so hard uh, for a lot of us to keep going because it's so easy to regress back into the old pattern when everybody mm. else is doing the same thing. So did you, I guess my question for you would be how, what was that journey for you? How did you stop caring what other people thought yeah. and taking it from that theory? Because like you said, yeah, other people's opinions are none of my business, but it feels a lot like your business when you hear about it. <laughs> and yeah. so what, what was that journey for you? Um, Cause you said it just started to be like, you weren't reacting as much, but what did that look like in actuality? Yeah. 
Honestly, I feel like it's almost building a callus. I'm a dancer. That's my background. I, I know, Sam, you dance too. Mm-hmm. Do you dance too, Gina? I, I was the dance team captain at my high school. <laughs> oh my God. Wait, so we're all the dancers. So we understand that when you dance, you start doing dance barefoot and then you have to like build up these calluses to do the turns on your feet, yes. basically. Yeah. To like do these different tricks to operate in a different way. You actually have to like kind of build up these calluses. And, and what I realized I love is that. I feel like I actually built up a callus to not allowing people's projections of me to affect how I feel about myself Mm -hmm. because that's what it really comes down to. In the moment, the emotion can really only last for 90 seconds. So the biggest thing that I personally did is I began to move through anything but anger. This is a technique my therapist taught me that I actually talked about on the internet so long ago and it went like crazy viral because people really related to it because I struggled so deeply with anger and defensiveness. Me too. So somebody wouldn't say something about me and I'd be like, bitch, I'll fight you or let's talk this out right now. Like, don't say that behind my back. Say it to my fucking face. And I would like be so defensive and so Mm -hmm. angry. And when I learned the anything but anger technique, it really changed my life because then I began every time I had that defensive part of me come up, the part of me that wanted to protect, but in an aggressive warrior Aries way, as we do, Mm -hmm. I realized, okay, I need to actually what am I actually feeling underneath this? And what I was really feeling was sadness because maybe I felt betrayal from a friend or maybe I felt sadness or maybe I felt lonely. Maybe I felt Mm -hmm. lonely because I felt excluded or I felt like somebody didn't didn't like me. And, And I just think when I began to move through that emotion of being sad first rather than defensive and I moved through that threshold, eventually the more that I felt the true sadness and the true emotion, I was able to feel through it and move through it. And that kind of built this callus to be like, it doesn't, it doesn't mean that I'm like hardening to the world. Like I feel like it allows me actually to have a more open heart to the people that I love by realizing Mm. that sometimes their actions have nothing to do with me. Most of the time their actions and what they say and what they do really have nothing to do with me. Yeah. And So I think really, it was almost like a callousing up and just a practicing, like practicing being confronted with the discomfort of feeling maybe excluded or lonely or misunderstood. That's the big word. Mm, Misunderstood. misunderstood. Oh my God. Yes. I had to come to terms with being misunderstood. And I think it came through practice and kind of building, building that callous to being like, honestly, people are going to misunderstand me. And I just realized like, I've experienced this my entire life and I wasn't able to identify it till this year when it happened with a really close friend of mine that I've had for like 10 years, but I'm going to trigger people Mm -hmm. because we all trigger people, but like, especially people like the three of us who are living in our authenticity and living in our purpose and living out our dreams and doing what the fuck we want to do, that's going to trigger the deepest insecurities of some people close to us. And it was really tough for me to understand because I was like, wait, like, I want the best for my friends. Like I would never be jealous of them. I would never judge them because of my own insecurities. Like I just genuinely wouldn't because I feel like I'm living in my authenticity. Exactly. So I don't have that threat, that thread of insecurity that would create that projection. And it made me really sad when I had a really good friend literally tell me, I can't watch your stuff because like, it makes me insanely jealous. Like it makes me, makes me really not like myself. And it was just like so tough. And I think that situation me learning how to respond to it and be like, okay, I'm going to feel the sadness. I'm going to move through that sadness of feeling betrayed or lonely or whatever with this friend. And then it kind of just like built this deeper stability ground for myself. I don't know how else to explain it, but I think just going through it and practicing made it easier for the future. And the first time's the worst. Like the first time I had a viral video go viral and then I had like so many people hating on me, I sobbed for like five days. Like I was like, Mm. I can't handle this. But then after that, it got a lot easier. And the same thing with like this friend, like once I got through that, once I moved through that, then it got easier. It's just through like practice, truly. There's no like quick fix, I guess. It's just being met with the discomfort of being misunderstood and then choosing to act differently. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, that's exactly how you break a pattern, right? Is to respond differently. And something that I love about you sharing your experiences and again, putting forward this idea of practice is that we don't heal these things overnight. And it's something that Gina and I have been putting forward in all of our episodes that it's obviously a spiraling higher journey. We're not looking to never experience these triggers again. I'm actually looking forward to experiencing triggers to see how 
different I respond because that's actually the sign of my growth, not the absence of the triggers. If I'm experiencing an absence of triggers, then what that means is I'm basically self-isolating. I'm not in society. I'm not actually pushing myself to my edge because as soon as I engage in other relationships or engage and want to inspire myself to move to an expanded version of myself, I'm going to be triggered. And likewise, yes, we're also going to trigger other people. And that's obviously not our work to do. We cannot actually move through someone else's trigger. And Mm -hmm. when we try to do that, we actually rob them of the opportunity to be able to do that for themselves. And so I'm glad you were able to recognize that, but also it's still a painful experience. And so I want to hold space for that because I think that a lot of us in like the spiritual development space, we experience a trigger and it's almost like we judge ourselves for how well we're able to not be affected by that. You know what mm-hmm. I mean? It's like the the, le- yeah. the less I'm affected by it, the more like spiritual I am or something, right? But I feel like the more totally. healed or evolved you are is how you respond to the hurt parts of you, right? Not mm-hmm. how little you respond to this thing at all. Because for a long time, I or thought- how quickly you get over it. Yes, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Because for a long time, I kind of like- rated my my spiritual resilience based on like how little things could impact me. And I will say mm-hmm. it definitely gets to that point where things do impact you less. But now I'm looking at how do I take care of myself when those things happen? Essentially, yes. how can how much more loving am I towards myself? Because even that expectation that I shouldn't be upset about it, like that's not very loving. And so for my past year, it's really been asking myself with any action that I'm taking, is it loving or non-loving? And it reveals to me Mm -hmm. right away what the energy is behind it. And so I'm just, I'm just appreciating you sharing. I I literally love that. I love that you said like, it's about the, I feel like you, I'm like, I need to run that part back. I need to run (laughs) that part back multiple times because you were like, you don't have to judge yourself for how you are responding. The judgment doesn't yeah. do anything. The, ju- no. <laughs> the really judgment's does. another pattern. That's just another, that's just another whole thing to like unpack within us. And I love that you also said um, how spiritual I am. Cause that's something I've completely like let go. Removed. <laughs> yeah. But I just let go of is just being like, I am not in the business of appearing spiritual in that identity, in that box to anybody. (laughs) Like, Mm -hmm. I'm just not in the business of that anymore, but I used to because I was like, oh, this is part of my identity. And that's also the big shift that I've been feeling in the last two, three months is this like box mentality, this like 3D box mentality. I don't know if anyone's going to see this video, but I'm like literally putting my hand in like a box to this like circular, expansive 4D Mm. reality where we exist in multitudes, where we are more than just one thing. And now I don't even like say like, oh yeah, like I'm, I'm I'm spiritual. Like maybe I do say that, but it's not something that I claim as like my identity because I'm just learning. It's so it's such a weird fine line because well, you guys will probably relate yeah. to this. Well, there's so much ego actually hiding behind spirituality. It's like, how can I mm-hmm. find another thing to bolster my sense of self through, to feel superior through? And people do that through spirituality in the same way that people do that through religion, but it's just taking on like another form, right? And I think any person who has a spiritual practice to some degree has had to go through that phase of finding their ego and spirituality or hiding their ego and spirituality. Yeah. As in like, well, if I meditate this much, then I will be this like enlightened. If I read these types of books, if I go to these types of courses, if I go to these types of events, and all of it is still proving energy. All of it is still, I need to do this, then that. All of it still says that you're dredged and lack and that you're not enough and you have to use spirituality to get there. All of it is still looking for validation. And so I agree with you. I do not really identify anymore with being a spiritual person. I feel like the identity that I'm trying to fall into more and more as opposed to spiritual is just human. And to be so deeply raw and human is naturally to be spiritual. Like we are spiritual beings in human bodies. And so, yeah, we don't need this title anymore of like, I'm spiritual and I do this because it's just another mask for ego to hide. Mm -hmm. This reminds me of something that my therapist told me. Uh, Maybe it was like a year ago and I was experiencing this sense of wanting to make myself feel better about myself by comparing myself to others, realizing that is just insecurity in another form. Just because you feel better than other people actually means that you feel terrible about yourself deep inside. Absolutely. And my therapist looks at me and she's like, Kayla, you aren't better than anyone. The crackhead (laughs) on the side of the road. Like we are all one. We are all equal. And that fucking hit me like a truck. I was like, whoa. Because I 
yeah, of course, like I have these judgments towards people in my life and I dive into like comparison and that's just like part of the ego and part of like experiencing navigating being a human. But when she said like, you're no better, you're no worse than that friend or that literally like drug addict or whatever it is, I was just like, you're so right. And it hit me. And in that moment, it actually was a deep aha moment. It was like yeah. a transformational moment. And what I love about transformation, which is the name of my new season that probably will be going during this time yes. when this episode comes out, mm-hmm. is that change happens periodically over time and we kind of see it periodically, but transformation can happen instantly. Like it can mm. just be that aha moment. Somebody can say something in a completely different way. And when she told me like, you're no better than like the drug addicts in Paia who are like screaming and like making fires, I was like, you're so right. And I just realized that like to make myself try to feel better is insecurity in motion. That's mm-hmm. not me yes. acting in my most secure sense of self. And now my non-negotiable, my, I don't want to call it a rule because I don't like to like live by the rules, but my non-negotiable and like my devotional promise to myself is I don't make decisions from the insecure part of me anymore. If insecure me is the one that is just like existing, I need a pause. I need to Mm -hmm. tap into creativity to flow state. I need to get in nature. I need to do something else. And then secure me can make the decision because insecure me is going to be making decisions for finding a sense of fulfillment. And fulfilled me is going to be making the decisions that are in alignment with the path that Mm -hmm. I'm meant to walk. Yeah. Yeah, It's not like a protective stance of it trying to yeah protect you from something or trying to make you look a certain way. But I think the thing with that though, is it's really actually hard because that insecure version, it's happens really slow. I find where you're feeling really secure, everything's going great. You're all aligned. And then it's such a slow process where I find that sometimes I just wake up and I'm like, Whoa, when did she come back? When did she get back here? Like I didn't even realize until I mean, this is why I think everything happens for a reason and why the universe is always working out for us is because when we're starting to feel those crunchy parts of our life or when we're starting to feel a lot of resistance, that's always a sign for me that I'm not living from my true self. Mm -hmm. And I'm so thankful for these signs because that's the only way that I would know. Because if everything continued to go well, I would continue to make decisions from that insecure place thinking that that's my true self, right? So I think that's important to look out for as well when you're doing this work. Obviously, it takes a lot of awareness and discernment. And to your point of just doing things in stages and steps, I feel like now I am able to identify pretty quickly just based on the thoughts that I have, the sensations I have in my body, who I'm operating from or what level of me I'm operating from. Whereas before they were so blended, it was very hard for me to see. I thought I was in a really secure place, but like you said, it's like you're still worrying about what other people think about you, but you think you're doing it from the spiritual place. So you're not really labeling that as you being insecure. So I wanted to just name that because I think it's hard for any of us to sometimes notice when our patterns are starting to take over. Um, We kind of go into the backseat, the pattern starts to take over and all of a sudden you look over and you're like, wait, I'm not even driving anymore. <laughs> no, totally. And it's almost like also the the version of ourselves that thinks almost I'm acting in self-love because I think that I'm really great. Yes. Um, that is like the kicker right there where you're like, oh, I think that I'm operating from this self-love. But then once I realize it makes me think that I'm better than anyone else, that's how I know that's like the little like secret that I can be like, oh, wait, no, this is actually not yeah. coming from the place that... I want to intentionally come from because that place wouldn't even see anybody as comparison. I know. It It doesn't make sense. Yeah. Like from the new paradigm, the comparison doesn't make sense. And I love that you mentioned that because that's one of the brain breakers I provide to my clients is that if you think you're worse than everyone, then what your solution is to not feeling that way anymore is to become better than other people. And it like, Uh, it's exactly that realization you had where you're like, oh my God, you're right. Like if I think I'm worse than other people, then the solution must be that I have to become superior, <laughs> like through whatever means necessary. And um, I wanted to add on to what Gina said by saying too, that what's so interesting is that when you're really in the secure self, you don't struggle to make decisions. Like that mm. is only present when you're in insecurity. I mean, there was something I was trying to make a decision about for the last two months. And obviously, because it's taken two months, I experienced probably some insecurity around it. But interestingly, today, I was on a meeting with my my assistant, and I just quickly made the decision about what to do. And I was like, oh, that's how I know I'm back. 
right? Because oh, when yes. I'm in my secure self, I don't fear a negative future. I don't make up the story of something bad happening to me. I don't make up the story of me being worthy or less worthy in the future. I feel okay with who I am. Therefore, any decision I make comes from that and is not trying to secure me somewhere in the future. And so I notice that if I'm coming from insecurity, I'm kind of relying on the future to save me, which is why I'm struggling so much to make a decision because I need yeah. the decision to quote unquote, be the right one so that it will save me from all the insecurity I feel. But when the insecurity Whoa. wave has been like, like wiped away, I'm just back in security. And I'm like, this is what we're going to do because I no longer fear that anything's going to take me away from where I've already managed to come back to. It's like, I'm already in the place that I wanted to get to through this decision. So no decision is going to bring me away from that. Wait, I'm waiting for the future to save me from my current state. That is hitting me so hard because we were talking before we hopped on this call about me like traveling all year. So then I moved back in with my parents to like save save money so that I could spend my money traveling and whatever. Mm -hmm. But now I'm like back with my family. And we were talking about this earlier, feeling a lot of shame, feeling a lot mm -hmm. of um, self-judgment coming in from that being like, oh my God, like I'm 24 and I moved back in with my parents, like, and all of that coming in. And I'm having the hardest time making decisions. The one thing that I feel so secure about in my life is my career, the podcast, what I'm creating that I actually have such deep clarity with. But where I live, where I belong, where I want home to be also encapsulate, encapsulates my relationship. I have an eight-year partnership and I'm 24. So that is just a whole nother thing to unpack. And I've been like, oh my God, but if I didn't have him, would I move? Like, And I've been in such indecision. And when you said that, it just felt like you were speaking such truth that I am waiting for the future to save me. Yeah. from this place of insecurity that I'm currently feeling, which I actually feel uncomfortable with the insecurity mainly because like I actually have in my life lived in the fullest expression of being decisive and just like knowing what I mm -hmm. want and knowing my preferences and knowing what feels like a yes and knowing what feels like a no. But I feel like because I've healed so much of my mass, like the toxic masculinity and I've leaned so much into the divine fem feminine flow and surrender, I feel mm -hmm. like parts of myself are not missing, but they're hibernating <laughs> is what I'm, what I'm saying. They're kind of hibernating. And I'm kind of like, where is that version of myself that is decisive and stable and secure? Like I'm, I'm ready to nurture my divine masculine like a little bit more. And when you said that about the future, saving us from the present, I was just like, holy fucking shit. That is the harsh truth it's that I truth. needed to hear. The reason, first of all, indecision is a decision. Also, yep. I will say that yes. is a decision in itself to typically self-sabotage or yes. avoid some sort of responsibility. And I think that's, I'm, I, I haven't been taking full accountability and responsibility for my life. What would like the advice be for me? Because I'm actually so confused. I'm like, where do I live? What do I do? Like, it's jam like, I just know that I need to move out of my parents' house because I need space to express myself. And at the same time, I'm also like, I wish I felt a strong sense of clarity with like where I wanted to live. Like, I'm just like begging for clarity, but it's really because I'm actually unhappy with this like current version of me, this current moment. And I know that like it exists in me, the fulfillment at this exact moment. Like I know that I could tap into it, but yeah, what would be, would be your advice for me? Because when you said the future is saving you, how do we move through that process? Like, how do we move through that process of wanting the future to save us. <laughs> like mm -hmm. that is, I feel like so many people are going to be like, whoa, because it's just so relatable. And I've never heard somebody put it like that. Yeah. I would ask you just honestly one question. Like what would you do if you knew there was no negative outcomes? Because there, what would I do if I knew? There's not yeah. any. That's the thing. There's not, totally. there's not any. We just create the story that we're not going to be able to handle something. But if there was no negative outcome, then what would we feel called to do? And I think the reason why yeah. we don't move towards the thing we feel called to do is, is because we've created a story around how that could lead to a negative result. But there really are no negative results. There are only neutral circumstances that we will eventually distort. So if we choose to remain conscious and not distort things that happen in our reality, then there's no circumstance to actually fear. Like, what is the worst thing that can happen? Totally. I think when you said that, actually, the first thing that came into me was waiting yeah, and how actually waiting feels like the best decision because I don't have clarity on where I want to live next or kind of what this right. next chapter will look like. And I'm feeling this pressure to 
make a decision, but honestly making this decision to be like, I'm going to only focus on January. I'm not going to focus on making a big life change because I'm also feeling like some end of year escapism being like, oh my God, do I need to just literally like start my life all over again? And I always have to remember that zero to 100, that all or nothing mindset. Whenever that comes up, that is always the ego. That is never my truth. So I've been coming back to reminding myself that. And at the same time, when you said that, like, what would you do if there was no negative outcome? The answer in my head was like, I would wait a little longer until I have clarity instead of being like judging myself for being back with my parents. And what does that mean? And, and having all these stories spiraling of like feeling, I don't know, the failure is not a right word, the right word, but some sort of like failing going on. Definitely the feel of fear of failure coming in. I think for a lot of people, like they're going backwards, like it's a step back. I think that seems to be a common theme. But yeah, I think the follow-up question I would ask um, somebody in your shoes is, you know, what part of you is so desperate to know? Because usually there's a part of you that's not okay with the lack of clarity because maybe there's a part of you that's afraid, um, worried, um, anxious, you know, all of these different things are attached to, yet ultimately it's unsafety, right? This doesn't feel safe. Unfamiliarity is what's not safe to our bodies. What's familiar is what's safe, even if it's not good for us, quote unquote. So, you know, if we lived in a chaotic home, that will feel safe. So we'll start to create chaos around our lives so that we can start to feel familiar again. So even this, where you're back at home, you have all this time, like to someone that'd be like the best case scenario. I joked about this before we hopped on where I'm like, whose house can I move back into (laughs) to be rent free, to just be able to have everything taken care of for me and sharing meals and not having to worry about that. But you know, for someone else, that might not feel as good, but I don't think it's the actual circumstance. Of course, it's again, the stories around it and what we're making that mean. And so there's like, I do the same thing. I constantly create chaos around me. Um, And so when things are kind of chill and things are flowing, I'll start to create problems. And so instead of trying to solve that problem, I have to go back to who is worried about this in the first place. And when I go back to that, it is, of course, the inner child. It's the version of me that doesn't know what to do when the house is quiet and no one's yelling. And so when I get to that route, I get to tell that part of me, this is safe. This calm is safe. And it, if it doesn't feel safe, what can we do to bring safety to that? Um, and I think a lot of that goes back to what you said earlier, which is allowing yourself to feel the feeling and to identify instead of it being unclear, unclear, it's kind of like your anger thing. What's under the feeling of feeling unclear? What's under that, right? Is it disappointment? Is it a fear of abandonment? Is it a fear of being left behind? There's, I think there's deeper layers. No, I totally. I, when you said that, like what part of you isn't okay with waiting. Like Mm -hmm. I was just like, whoa, that is something to truly dive in and unpack. But we were talking about this earlier, the hyper independence. And I, first of all, I'm, I'm an Aries. So we already have, we talked about (laughs) Mm -hmm. that. I already have like that hyper independence. And also I was raised an only child. Like I have three half brothers, Mm -hmm. but they're all like 20 years older than me. So I like grew up very dependent on my, on myself and on my parents. But I feel like this hyper independence is coming in and it's asking me what I've been really actually leaning into is the feeling of how can I almost move in opposition to my limiting beliefs and my past programmings because mm-hmm. they are kind of feeding me these, these fears, these false evidence appearing real, you know, like yeah. these fears that are coming in. And what I'm realizing is instead of being like trying to figure out the solution to like, oh my God, like I need to, I need to do, do all these things so then I can have clarity within my energy. And then like, maybe the solution will come to me, you know, the things that I've done in the past, I think it's actually asking me, how can I actually lean on my family more? Like, how can I actually like lean into community more? And how is that actually exactly what I need and exactly what I'm craving instead of trying to fight the situation that I'm in? And my question for you guys would be like, How do we know when we're having this limiting belief come up of like, for example, with me, okay, I, I I want to be away from my parents. I want to move out. Like I need to like do this whole thing and like escape kind of this escapism mindset, but also being like, well, maybe this is genuinely what I feel for my next piece of my path or being like, okay, maybe this is asking me to look at the parts of myself that maybe 
need to use this opportunity to connect with my parents more or to connect with my community more here on Maui because also that's something that I feel growing up and and moving away and then moving back to my hometown which I feel like a lot of people can relate to it's kind of like oh my god like I'm in my hometown like knowing people like I don't know like there's a lot of resistance there for me but I'm actually like wondering now is this asking me to relax into depending on others more Hmm. Yeah. Well, the last hundred years of social conditioning has been moving us towards hyper independence, and definitely, definitely be- leading us to believe that it's virtuous and noble and superior to being dependent. Right. I mean, when oh, we think superior. Of, also, that was a good word. Yeah. Superior. Yeah. Hyper independence is superiority because dependency is weakness. That's what we've been told. And for the last hundred years, we've completely forgotten about interdependency. Like that's just gone out the window completely. It's like, it's either one of these. It's either I'm hyper-independent, I'm masculine energy, I'm taking care of business, or I'm some weak ass that like can't do anything on my own and I need all these people to be around me. Whereas community, which we've completely lost that aspect, right? Community asks us to be literally interdependent. What's so crazy to me is people don't know this, but the human species is actually adapted and evolved for... um, as a species, like we adapt and evolve as a species, not as individuals. And so it makes sense that most of us are going to have very different strengths, very different weaknesses, because we are literally adapting to evolve as a group. Like the, the basic, like basically the most uh, biological fitness of the species, not of each person. And so we've completely mm-hmm. like conflated our sense of self-worth with like how independently amazing we are at all of these things without realizing that what makes us amazing as humans is our ability to literally interdependently work together. Like that's what makes the human race so incredible. And we're all out here trying to like do everything on our own. And so what I would really ask yourself is like, how can I allow my inter- my relationships to be more interdependent, which is going to actually foster a lot more connection too, because if we are always hyper independent, then how can we ever create a close connection with anyone? Right? Like I'm never going to totally. be able to lean on Gina. She's never going to believe that she can even lean on me because what I've noticed about my hyper dependency is that what it creates in other people is alienation. Like, Oh, like Mm -hmm. she never like needs anything. So I don't want to go to her for anything, right? Like she never asked me, so I'm never going to ask her. So then we create more isolation, more separation. And I think when we really think about what our values are in life, they are going to be connection, community, right? And so when you think about that, I think it helps you realize that it's only your past conditioning that's creating the anxiety. Because if you're really present, you could actually make a conscious choice to invest in your interdependent relationships. And then all of a sudden the anxiety about being at home is completely gone. And mm-hmm. also we exist in cycles. So like it yeah. is just a part of it. Maybe this is the lesson that I need to learn now. And then, cause I've just been one, I just know from past experiences that whenever I clear whatever's going on within me, whenever I clear that out, then the external opens up immediately. It's like, oh, of course, boom, yeah. You, you moved through this like threshold. Like here it is, the thing that you were asking for originally, but then Absolutely. now you don't even want it. So now we'll give it to you. Like having that experience <laughs> is so funny because I've had it so many times, like in the last like five six years, that I'm like, okay, like I know this is how it works. So instead of like going against it, like I'm I'm, I'm trying to like swim upstream right now. It's like maybe the lesson here is to dive into learning how to interdepend and the beauty in that. And like, how special is it that you have family and that you have community and that you have like a small island and a small hometown? Like, how special is that? And I think that's really what I'm going to lean into rather than being like, oh my God, I need to fix the problem. And that's what we were talking about earlier. Stop fixing Mm -hmm. the problem and begin to heal the pattern. And I think the pattern for me is hyperdependency, yes, But it's also feeling like I need to solve everything. It's the solution. That's also my human archetype, um, uh, human design archetype. I don't know if you guys know about human design at all, but I'm literally Mm -hmm. the problem solver. (laughs) Like that's literally (laughs) my archetype. And I've felt that my entire life. And I feel like I have let go of that and, and, and released it a lot in the last couple of years. And yet like there's that still that like string of me that is like, oh, but we got to fix this. 
we got to solve this. But that's a beautiful piece, right? But I think with everything, there's always going to be a high road and a low road or like a distorted version or like the healthy version, right? And, you know, for me personally, when I am really wondering what to do, because I was like that too, I obsessed over the future, obsessed about making the right choices. But whenever I am constantly asking the same question of what do I do? What do I do? It's always a sign that I'm talking too much and I'm not stopping enough to listen. So I actually gave this analogy in a past episode of a walkie-talkie. And I look at it like I'm holding a walkie-talkie, pushing the button down, and I keep asking the universe, what do I do? What do I do? What, what, what should I do? Is this right? Is this right? And I have my finger on the button, so I can't even transmit what the universe is trying to respond back. The only way that you can listen for those next steps or for the wisdom within all of this is to let go of the button and listen. And if you don't know what to do, get quiet. And maybe you're not supposed to know what to do. And maybe there's a beauty in that. Even you naming this possible lesson of leaning on your family more. Yeah, absolutely. That could totally be a lesson. But there's probably so many other lessons baked in that there's no way you'll be able to predict. And I love that about the unknown. I love that the unknown holds so many experiences and lessons and wisdom that I cannot even conceive from this now moment. So really opening and surrendering to what will come and trusting that if you don't know that you're not supposed to know and you're supposed to actually just be here and that's okay. That was a very hard lesson for me to learn though. Yeah. Yeah, I feel like there is so much beauty and unpredictability. And when you said that, it just felt this deep resonance within me where I'm like, how special is it that I actually don't know what's around the corner? Like, how cool Mm -hmm. is that? Like, and I love that reframe of being like, that is so special. Something that's really interesting, um, obviously for me as a coach, is being able to discern what my client's state of consciousness is based on the question. Like, what paradigm are they coming from based on what they're asking? And so what I heard from you is like, what am I supposed to do? What am I supposed to do? That's actually a very terrible question because it presupposes that there's a wrong thing to do and a right thing to do. And you are in this liminal space of not knowing which one is right and which one is wrong. And so that's going to create a lot of anxiety. I mean, it would be like, literally having two buttons to press. And it's like, okay, one button is going to like literally demolish the entire world. The other one makes sure that we're all safe and sound. You'd be like, (laughs) I don't know which one to press. But when you leave the paradigm of supposed to and allow yourself, like I get to, or I desire to, I hope to, I feel inspired to. Now both buttons or the infinite amount of buttons you have, they're all equal. There is no wrong one, bad one, incorrect one, right one. It's just, they're all just buttons you get to express yourself through. So whether it be deciding to stay at home for another month or deciding to get a new apartment, those are just going to be different expressions of your life. None of them are either wrong or bad or incorrect or lesser than or greater than. And so again, we're finding this theme of superiority, right? As if like one decision will allow you the avenue or direct pathway to a superior life and therefore a superior you. Whereas if you understand deeply that there is no superior life path, there is no superior you, then either one of these is fine. And then anxiety completely dissipates because there is no decision that will save you. You save you by realizing you don't need either one of those decisions to save you. Wait, no, that is actually the best thing that you could have said to me because it's funny because I actually like always say that and then like you hear from somebody and then you're like, oh, okay, (laughs) I hear it now. I'm listening. I'm understanding. I'm comprehending. But there is no right or wrong decision. And that's something I've definitely been leaning into almost to the point where I feel like it has made decisions at first a little bit more difficult. And I think that's normal. Whenever we begin to implement a new pattern, Mm -hmm. there is going to kind of be that discomfort. And that's just part of making it familiar to us once again and, and, and familiar in a new way. And I have been kind of embracing there is no right or wrong. And I think that's almost made me be like, wait, there's no right or wrong. So what do I do? So which I know. one's right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so which one's so right? Which one's right? Like, there's no right or wrong. There's yeah. no right or wrong. There's n- there's no wrong. Period. Right. We're not used to it. It's, it's only like, right. It's like this idea that we're, I feel like I see a lot more people online these days talking about playfulness and bringing this curiosity into our lives, which is so beautiful. But when we start to do it, we feel wrong. Like, There should be rules. There should be consequences. And what's interesting is believing that there should be consequences is that we just end up self-punishing ourselves. We just create Mm -hmm. guilt. We create shame. We create disappointment, anxiety, depression. And none of these things are necessary. Like We don't need to punish ourselves for what we do not know because it's not a crime 
to not know. But that's what we say to ourselves unconsciously. Like, it's bad for me to not know. It's wrong for me to not know what I'm doing next. It's wrong for me to be in this like space of, uh, I don't know what to do next or here I go. It's like, but none of these things are actually wrong or bad. And so that's the work is actually uncovering what have I been conditioned to believe is wrong or bad. That's creating the situation mm-hmm. of guilt, anxiety, fear, because there's actually nothing to feel fearful about you being at home or not being at home. These are both gorgeous options for you to express yourself through. <laughs> and neither one of them is going to result in anything bad. Mm-hmm. Only fear Thank says you. that. I needed to hear that. And what is something that you guys personally do to begin to regulate that within the body? Like for me, like I really love EFT tapping and I love any sort of type of self-soothing. And at the same time, I find myself honestly looking also towards my addictions to self-soothe, which for me, Mm -hmm. my main addictions are smoking weed and going on social media. Those are like my two that I use as this kind of escape and sense of avoidance to avoid full accountability and responsibility. So I don't have to be responsible because I think I have a fear of responsibility as well. Um, (laughs) But I think that comes from almost like a overcorrection to being responsible for so long. And that's also something that I've really been observing within myself, the overcorrections that I take. Mm -hmm. Because as people who are self-reflective and self-aware and who have this beautiful urge to want to become the most joyful aligned version of of ourselves, it can come with this like extremist overcorrection that I notice in a lot of my friends who are in this space where once you realize something, it's like, okay, I get it. I had this aha moment. I see what needs to shift. I see how my response needs to shift. So I'm going to almost like overcorrect and have the pendulum completely swing the complete opposite direction. And in this overcorrection, we lose the balance where I just feel like I am craving that balance. Do you know yeah. what I mean? Like mm. I, I went from being like so responsible, so on it all the time to literally being like, how can I not be responsible? <laughs> like, well, the overcorrection just leads, the overcorrection just leads back to the same pattern again, right? Because it literally oh, is that opposite pendulum swing. Like if you read the Tao Te Ching, it talks all about the middle way, right? And how anything that we create with force will be met with an equal and opposite force, equal and opposite reaction. And so for us to go over correct to the left side or to the right side, we will immediately be met with the pattern that was what we were trying to get away from. And so the Mm. most counterintuitive thing is to literally go slow, right? Because I think for us, like you said, like these self-improvement girlies, we see the pattern and we're like, oh my God, I don't like that. I observe that. I want to change that. I'm empowered to change that. But then we go about it in a very non-loving way. I think that's the key. It's like, we see the pattern, but instead of being like, oh, wow, that's still there. Okay. Here's how I'm going to actually try to mitigate that. We actually push anger on top of it. We push judgment on top of it and criticism on top of ourselves for having it. So that's what leads to the overcorrection. And then that shame is just what drives the birth of the same pattern and actually the perpetuation Mm -hmm. of the pattern. And so we don't actually see the pattern being corrected. And it's so funny because we're so identified with being the overcorrector. Like I'm fixing everything, but we're like still the same. And that was a really big thing for me, like one to two years ago, because I really felt like, but I am doing everything. I am fixing everything, but the results were the same. And it was like, Mm -hmm. so what am I not doing? And it was this unwillingness to allow the pattern shifting to be slow because it basically is like the tortoise and the hare fable, like slow and steady wins the race. But I'm the rabbit every single time. I'm like, no, (laughs) I know the fastest way. I'm just going to go and do it like this. And then I always lose because I'm not willing to actually try to build that pathway and that trust with myself. Because essentially what I'm saying when I overcorrect is I don't trust myself to fix this. So I'm going to go at it like 105, 10, 50%. When in reality, if I really trusted myself, it would happen slow and steady. And that is the nature of healing. You said earlier, changing patterns takes time. That's like, the worst thing I could have ever heard from my coach or therapist a year ago, but I need to practice. I'm like, yeah. practice. Yeah. Like I already know what the pattern is. I just want to get over it. It's like, I, I just, just want to fix it. Just, yeah. I just want to fix it, fix it, fix it. But in the paradigm of needing to fix something, the only way to feel relief is to continue fixing things. And so you as that identified uh, archetype as a problem solver, think about it. In order to be a solver, you have to have problems. And so you exactly. literally keep giving space for problems to come into your awareness because you need to keep solving them in order to feel okay. And so that's why you have to kind of feel like 
okay with this liminal space where there's a problem and you don't go to solve it. And like, Uh, that's where the magic is because every time you go to solve it, you get like a dopamine hit. You're like, okay, I fixed that. I fixed that. So it's like, I'll just give you more of them to fix that you can feel good again. And so the Mm -hmm. hard work is like, see a problem, do the work around, okay, is this really a problem? Does this really need to be solved? And allowing it to be there, which is exactly the space you're in, right? Allowing it to be a quote unquote problem and not go to fix it. Mm -hmm. What I love about both of you is the questions that you ask, like the way that you're able to meet curiosity with just, just such understanding, honestly. Like I just feel so understood listening to you guys right now because I'm like, wow, that's the exact question that I need to ask. And I think that's the actionable step. Like when we were talking earlier, how I love mm-hmm. moving past the theoretical, the the not the right question. That's not the verb, verb, verb have that I want to <laughs> use, but the aligned question, the divine question. And that's what I need to ask myself is, does this need to be solved right now? And how beautiful does it feel to have like those anchors that we can grab onto, those questions that we can grab onto that really root us back to our truth? So I'm literally writing this down right now. Like, <laughs> does it need to be solved? Does it need, Gina, I'm curious what you were going to say because I feel like you had something. Yeah, um, I think with the whole pendulum swinging and the like overcompensation of trying to like, you know, fix it. I think when I think about like a child and if you were to notice that they needed to work or fix on fix something about themselves to be like, okay, we need to fix this right now. And it, it kind of, I think, has this energy of there's something broken and wrong with you. And I think anybody who's going into learning something new, if you are going into the re- arena as something that's terribly wrong with you, you're already starting on like you're already starting in the negative, right? And Mm -hmm. it's so hard to come out of that. But when it's like, hey, you're perfect, you're loving, you are love, you're worthy. And it's a more like newbie energy. And I think that's what I've been trying to embrace in my life, not just with things that I'm learning, but even just on my journey, this newbie energy of, I get to try things on and see how they feel. And I get to do it step by step. You know, like your bite-sized pieces, instead of it being like, I don't know, my daughter's learning swimming, for me to be like, you don't know how to swim. That's a huge problem. There's something wrong with you because you don't know how to swim. I'm going to push you off of a diving board. And that's only going to set her up for failure. Now she's drowning. Now she feels like she can't swim. And I think we do that so much in our spiritual journey. Uh, For somebody like me, I had a really big fear of being seen. So in the beginning, for me to just you know, try to make a million videos would have been so damaging and would have been so counterproductive to the journey of me trying to feel safe with that. So I feel like if you're noticing, you know, yourself going from one pendulum to the other, yeah, how much slower could you go? And I think the other question I always ask myself when I'm thinking about pace or trying to change a pattern is like, how does it feel? as I'm changing this. Because when I think about my daughter learning something from me, I want her to feel safe. I want her to feel loved. I want her to feel protected and kind of held. And I think when we are working on ourselves, we're not holding ourselves at all. We're almost, like I said, dragging or pushing. And so the invitation here is how can we really choose our pace and how can we really discern what pace feels right for us in that moment. And sometimes it is going to be a sprint and that does feel good. We can have this activated fire energy driving us, but sometimes it can feel really go, it can feel really good to go at a slower kind of water pace. And I think it just takes again that trial and error. Um maybe not even error, just trial. I, I always um compare this to like trying on clothes, you know, for an outfit, for going out somewhere. We get to try things on and see how they feel, you know, maybe not for right now, but maybe for later. And having fun with that, I think going back to what Sam said of this playful energy and not taking it so seriously, I think has been a huge, huge shift for me. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I honestly agree with everything you guys are saying. And what's coming through for me so strongly is how much I miss the prioritization of play and how I just really want to play more and how I want to be in the ocean more and surfing and dancing more and how me coming into these last couple months thinking that I need to figure something out so deeply that I need to like solve this has Mm -hmm. been taking my focus away from the things that really light me up. And it's so funny because I I just know from past experience and science that getting into flow state and tapping into play and creativity and joy and nature and movement, all these things actually activate your pattern recognition and allows us to solve things in a way that's actually way more intuitive, where it just like kind of flows through you and comes to you. And you're like, oh, wait, I didn't even have to think my way out of of how I was feeling. Like I just... 
I just moved through it. I just became outside of it all of a sudden. Like, and it just kind of happens when Mm -hmm. I'm enjoying. And I see Mm -hmm. that pattern in my past. And I'm just like, when was a time that I was able to move through something that felt unclear? Mm -hmm. And like coming back to, I did it then. And it's going to, I'm going to do it again. Like, exactly. Mm -hmm. Wow. Actually, I love that you brought up flow state because I would love to go deeper into that because it is so true. You can't solve a problem from the frequency of the problem. So the problem is actually solved not through whatever solution you find from that frequency, but is actually moving into a different state of being, right? It's almost like when you move into a different state of being, the problem that you thought needed to be solved is actually no longer a problem. So I always say to my clients, solving <laughs> problems is actually dissolving problems. And how do we dissolve problems? We move into different states of being. So I would love for you to talk about how you move into flow state, what sort of happens mm-hmm. for you there, and any sort of research that you have found along your own journey. Yeah, yes. Guys, I'm obsessed with flow state. I think it's literally the most magical state we can be in. It feels so good. Like for example, last week I was in LA and I recorded like four sessions at Spotify and was like, which also y'all got to come to LA and come to the studio because that would be so fun if we like aligned that at the same time to all getting, because it's just so affirming to be there. I'm just like, mm. holy shit. And like you guys also like would just like, I feel like it would just be so perfect, all of us together. It'd be so good. Um, With that being said, when I left, I literally felt high. My boyfriend picked me up and I got into the car and I was like, holy shit. The only other time that I feel like this is when I'm on actual MDMA. Like when I've taken, which I don't take often. Like (laughs) when I've actually done Molly or MDMA or ecstasy is the way that I feel right now. And he felt that way too, because he had just gone rock climbing. So we both got in the car and we were just like, oh my God, we are both so high. This is like the most addicting feeling And it's actually, uh, scientists don't like to call flow state addictive because, I mean, I don't really believe that words have meaning unless we give it to them, but there's kind of a negative connotation around addictive. Mm -hmm. Um, But they actually use the word autotelic, which means an end in and of itself. So flow state is literally a state that is an end in of itself. It's not, it's not the process. It's an end. It's an end. Mm. When you are in the state of flow, it is the end, (laughs) like in the best way possible where you're like, nothing else exists. You're not trying to get somewhere else. You are in the state of now. Exactly. And it's the best feeling ever is, I mean, we hear from all all the biggest writers, the power of now, you know, we hear like the key to the, the key to your joy is like in the present moment. And we hear that. And what I really love to unpack is the things that we constantly hear, but how to actually like make them like, okay, I, I understand them now. And flow state makes me understand that feeling because I actually black out. Like, I don't know what, what I, what I say when I'm on the mic. I, when I go on stage to perform a dance, I don't know what really happened. I just know that I was there, but I don't really remember it because I'm actually in a state of not trying to get to anywhere except exactly where I'm at in this present moment. And flow state has absolutely changed my life because I realized I was doing it all my life unconsciously and unintentionally. And those are the times that I felt the most joy and the most fulfilled. And now I'm like, how can I incorporate that into my life every single day? And for me, that looks like surfing, when I'm on the mainland, I love to go rock climbing. Also speaking, having conversations like this, like yeah. being in flow state, it it literally is the high that, that I've been looking for in all these other addictions my whole life. Like my addiction to the dopamine within social media mm-hmm. or um, just constantly like being surrounded by friends and depending on them for my joy and my happiness. Like all, all these, all these avenues that I've, that I've searched to find this type of feeling is what I find when I'm in flow state. And that Mm. is just, oh, it just fills me up so deeply. And I find it mostly in dance and in music, I would say is is the deepest place that I find flow state. And the best way to get into flow state for people who don't know is the challenge balance skill. So the key is to stretch, but not snap. So you want to do something that's challenging enough that you have to be concentrated. Concentration is kind of like this portal into the flow state. First, by being in concentration, it allows us to focus in 
And when it's a little bit challenging, you you kind of have to concentrate deeper to yeah. you know do whatever you're doing. But it can't be so difficult and so complicated that you feel frustrated. So you have to stretch yourself, but not snap. And that's why it's the challenge balance skill because you're finding that balance between being challenged and not being challenged. And then you're also mm-hmm. finding the balance between using some sort of type of skill. Like if you're developing some sort of skill that, you know, in the future, maybe potentially something that you want to lean into around mastery, you know, like having something that you want to do just because you want to do it, not because you want to get something out of it is really the key in this, in this tapping into the flow state. And it's just the best feeling ever. It's literally the natural high. That we're it all is craving. So like natural. Yeah. It's so high. it's real dopamine. Like I just feel like in a world that is it, it, where we have so much fake and false dopamine that so many of us are addicted to. My friends and I, so many of us, we talk about this all the time. We really do struggle with being addicted to those hits of dopamine. And for me, I've found that the best real dopamine, besides like sunshine and salt water, is flow state. And I think that's something that anyone can tap into wherever they are, which is something that I really love is that it's universal and that it's within Mm -hmm. us. And it's going to be different for every single person. There's so many different avenues of flow state, but we get that same feeling of being like, oh my God, all I want to do is exist. I don't want to be anywhere else, but I want to be here. And it actually creates this internal motivation, which is the secret that I've kind of been looking for for years. Because Like we've talked about when you guys came on my podcast, it was like, okay, I've been motivated by the external. I've been motivated by the guilt and the shame and, you know, feeling like something's wrong with me for so long. And now I'm really healing those parts of myself. Like not like a thread doesn't come up here and there, but I really do feel like I am healing those parts of myself. And with that, we talked about this on the podcast when you guys came on, I lost a lot of internal motivation. I lost Mm -hmm. a lot of that drive that I had, the drive that I honestly identified with a lot. I I identified with being somebody who got her shit done, who had a lot of drive, who had a lot of passion. Like that was a big part of my identity. And to heal the toxic masculine parts of myself that were operating from a place of self-hatred and shame and guilt and judgment, when I began to heal those parts of myself, I'm like, well, where is my motivation? Where yeah. is where is my discipline? Where where are these parts of myself that I also love? Like I love those parts of myself that are passionate and that take action and who come up who the part of myself that comes up with an idea and then actually creates it. Like I love, love, love that part of myself. And that's something that I want to nurture. But when I began to heal the wounded masculine, I began to lose that part of myself. And then when I found flow state. And when I kind of learned about flow state, I was like, this is the internal motivation that I was looking for because I'm doing Mm. these things because I love them. I'm doing these things because they just genuinely make me feel joyful. They make me feel naturally high. I'm doing this because I love myself and I want to nurture myself. And so that creates such internal motivation. And I think it doesn't just translate into the exact activity that you're doing. I think it translates into every single area of your life because I'm more lit up. And I'm moving from a place of being lit up from within and that kind of like propelling me forward rather than it being like this external shame pushing me forward. It's like the Mm -hmm. propelling of this internal light. So that's why I have just fell in love with learning about flow state and also, you know, allowing people in my community in the soul and progress community to get into their bodies. We're doing a lot of like somatic movement and somatic healing to kind of get us in that flow. And Or for example, like when I do photo shoots, I'm a photographer and I move so quickly. Like I move so quickly so that people can't get in their heads. And people Mm. are like, oh, like the the guys usually who like, guys just usually don't like to take photos, but they're like, that was actually like really fun. Like I really Mm -hmm. like that. I'm like, well, I just don't let us think too much because Mm -hmm. thinking takes us out of our body. It takes us out of the flow state and it feels good to be present. Like it feels good when time goes by like that. 30 minutes goes by and it feels like 30 seconds. It feels, oh, I just feel like good isn't the right word. The word is joyful. The word is lit right. up. The word is um Like you're levitating. Passionate. Levitating. Mm-hmm. Yes. No, that's literally what it feels like. So I've just been tapping into that so much more and prioritizing it because it is, I mean, time is our energy and it is our currency that we are experiencing. And I'm just choosing consciously of my free will to put more time into the things that put me into flow state because I know that I get that feeling. 
I get that mm, feeling right. and I'm getting it a little bit right now and it feels so good. Right, which is all we ever want from a thing. And so it's interesting that you've been able to really make more of your priority to get into flow state rather than like get more things done. Because what's so yeah. ironic is that the reason why we want to get things done is so that we can fall into states like flow, right? So that exactly. we so that we can fall into a state of no tension, so that we can fall into ease and relaxation. That's why we want those things. We think that they're, they're going to give us permission to go slow or to relax. And so if we can actually prioritize how to find and feel into those states more in our life, we wouldn't feel as much grippiness for those external things. Like if we felt so truly internally fulfilled, why would we need stuff from the outside? Why would we even need the future? Why would we even need time? Like we only need these things from scarcity. And we think that things are going to give us that, but it's actually yes. a state that gives us that, not the things. Totally. We think that getting our shit done is the prerequisite for enjoying life. Yes. <laughs> like but it's actually, yes. it's the yeah. thing that keeps us from enjoying life. Enjoying that's, life. The, exactly. that's the crazy yeah. kicker. It's like, we actually think, yes, I need this prerequisite. I need this precursor, but needing that is what keeps you from getting it. It's like, it keeps pushing yeah. it out in a way. Mm-hmm. So what do we do? <laughs> well, what do we don't do? What do we be? Because that's like the doing, right? Like yeah, the archetype of just like being a human doing. It's like, oh wait, what do we need to be then? Like what, mm. what paradigm do we need to exist in then? Like, because mm. it's just kind of like, that feels so far-fetched to me to be like, oh, well, like I'm just not going to get my stuff done. And then I can, I can just relax without getting my stuff done. Like, you do get your stuff done though, right? We're not right, saying that okay. you don't do anything and that you just chill on the beach all day, right? But it's more <laughs> that when you're in that state, those things will naturally come to you yes. to act on. And when you're acting on those things, it won't feel like, oh, I have so many things to do. You'll be moving with flow, right? So one of the things that's been coming up a lot in our container actually has been one of my favorite quotes, which is that your story follows your state, the narratives in your mind, the questions that you're asking, the thoughts that you're having, they're always going to follow your state. The stress that you experience when you're doing your work, that's going to come from your state. So instead of trying to solve the narrative and change the words and the thoughts and really trying to fix your mind, when we go into our bodies and we soothe ourselves in whatever way will work for you, you had mentioned a couple things that you do. Um, and I think for me, I mean, I am a somatic coach, so I have a lot of different tools in my toolbox, but really one of the easiest ones is truly the breath, right? Just literally slowing down my breath. So I actually gave this to one of our uh, um, clients as well, where she w- came into one of the sessions and she was just talking a mile a minute and uh, was very in air air kind of space. And um, the practice I gave her was talking slower. And that when you start talking slower, you automatically give your body a chance to like slow down and you notice how much faster you're going. And yeah. so I do this as well when I'm working. I'm like, huh. I have like 4,000 tabs open. I'm texting somebody. I'm trying to do all of these different things. And when I become aware of how fast I'm going, and how uncomfortable it feels because that does not feel good, right? One of the questions I always ask is, how does this feel? And so when that doesn't feel good to me, it's how can I slow down all the way so that I can really see how fast I want to go? Because if you only slow down like a tiny bit, you're still going a lot faster than you realize. I feel like you have to slow down all the way to notice, oh, wow, I was moving at a very kind of unsustainable pace. So I think for me, it's always about, yeah, going into the body, soothing the body, getting yourself in a regulated state within your window of tolerance. And then from there, I think those actions become very clear and they become, I don't want to say easier. Um, they just don't be, they're just not things that you feel like are difficult. I don't, you don't even think that it's easy, right? When you're riding a bike, you're not like, this is so easy. You're just riding the bike. Um, and so I think that's the same thing. Because you're moving we're in with the that, bike. And mm, same thing yes. with flow. You're moving with time instead of against time, mm-hmm. right? Like mm, moving with time. Yeah, because when you're anxious, your energy is going faster than the present moment. Like yes. the present moment is actually always chill. It's going at the same speed all the time. You leave the present moment by going fast. And exactly. so imagine if you were riding a bike, but trying to go in front of it. How would... That wouldn't even work. Yeah, <laughs> like, that wouldn't even work. How Exactly. But that's what we do in our life. And it doesn't work literally we're like Mm -hmm. tripping over our own energy and it's like we're not getting anywhere faster we're actually making it harder (laughs) like 
we wouldn't be able to make the bike move, right? If we were in front of it. And so that's what we do. Mm -hmm. We create all this resistance by actually trying to go faster than time, faster than now. And so by slowing down and becoming present in that flow state, that's how you start feeling like, it feels like the energy is like pushing you from behind, like propelling you rather than like you forcing yourself forward. Um, And it's what David Hawkins talks about, the difference between power versus force in his book and how so much of our world, especially after the industrial revolution was all built by force. But if you really think about it, anything built by force needs force to maintain it. And so it will never feel good. And so anything that we actually create in flow only needs flow to maintain it. And so the, mm-hmm. the key is to get into flow, not to try to achieve flow by force, right? They're completely different energies. I love that you're saying this because the big realization that I've been having is that I was very much so in my masculine and then I was very much so pendulum swing over correction in my feminine. And I'm, I'm going back into my business and I'm meeting these resistance walls. And I had this realization the other day that the real that the reason that I'm having these resistant walls that are coming up for me is because I'm trying to do things in the same way that I built them on. Like you said, like mm-hmm. I built it with force. So now I'm trying to keep it with force. And now I'm like, oh, I'm actually stepping into creating a way of entrepreneurship that you guys are also experiencing too. So that's why this is perfect. Stepping into entrepreneurship in a way that is in flow, that is in tune with cycles, that is more guided by the divine feminine. And I'm realizing that there is no blueprint for that because no one's ever done it before. And we're moving from this iron age of the physical based really in that industrial revolution that you're saying that's been coming through for me. So so that the Mm -hmm. fact that you talked about the industrial revolution, I'm like, that's crazy because I've been thinking so much about the industrial revolution because I think it really re- represented this iron age, this earth, this physical, this, this, um, this just emphasis on material basically. Mm-hmm. And now mm-hmm. we're moving into the golden age, which is like the golden age is like, how can we expand? And that's why like AI is like coming in and all that stuff, because it's like, mm-hmm. how can we move, move beyond our physical and into this like energetic realm? And I'm really feeling that this year in particular, moving in and creating like a somewhat like business plan, like not nothing crazy, but like stepping in and and, and doing my business in a different way that I've never done it before. And I'm realizing that I'm just having to create the blueprint because there is none, like there is none. (laughs) And that's why it feels so uncomfortable because it's like, oh my gosh, my, my parents definitely did not do anything like this. They were deeply prioritized in working hard. And like, that was their main thing. And that was like that generation. And now we're stepping and we're all doing things in a different way that no one has ever, ever, ever done before. I mean, they have been done before, but since the industrial revolution, since like the iron age of this yeah. physical, now we're moving into this golden age. It's like, okay, like how do we do things in a different way? Because something created in force can only be withheld in force. And I want to create something yes. in flow so that it can be sustained with flow. And I love that you mm-hmm. said that. That's perfect. Yeah. And I think when it comes to this whole masculine energy and the feminine energy, when it comes to entrepreneurship, I mean, I was somebody that definitely operated heavily in masculine. Um, And I think when it comes to trying to start working in your business where you're not in this toxic kind of energy where it's hustle, 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 I really think it comes down to like custom dosage. And I think that there's certain tasks in your job where you do need a little bit of masculine energy. And then the sums that are just going to be a lot softer. And what I started to play around with was you know, certain things that I was trying to do from feminine uh, flow also felt not right. And I realized, mm. oh, it's because I need like a dash of masculine in here. And oh, I now it's like, I got to turn this gear on and we get to really channel these different parts of us instead of it being like one lump of masculine. And that's all you get, right? We get to create these almost elixirs or like recipes for ourselves. And I feel like that's such a fun part of this, right? Like when I'm on a coaching call, it's a very different energy than when I'm doing this. Very different when I'm doing my taxes. They all require different combinations of these energies. And I think that that's really important to note because I think for anybody who's healing from the hustle, I think the tendency is to eliminate the masculine altogether. But I think there's absolutely a healthy dosage of that energy that is necessary for any entrepreneur, that drive, that fire activation. Um, so I think it's it's fun to kind of experiment and see how much, like a dash of this, a pinch of that. Um, it's been fun to kind of discover for me on my journey. And 
honestly, like I've built many businesses in the past and this one, it's actually amazing how good it feels. Um, and I, like I said, sometimes I do try to create chaos unconsciously because I'm trying, I'm not used to building a business this way. I'm used to business being built. Like I do not sleep until it gets to a certain point and I'm resting more than I ever have. Um, but to see the business and the people, um, and the impact that we're making without that force is evidence enough for me to know that I'm on like the quote unquote right track. And I get to keep, like I said, making these really beautiful combinations of my energy um, for, that's best suited for for that moment that I'm in. I love the elixirs. That's literally so yeah, me too. <laughs> How can we add a dash of this and a dash of that? And then even coming at it from just such an intentional point of view, I just noticed that once I come at something with intention, it it operates in that way. Like once I yeah. say like, this is actually my intention behind it, that's the way that I actually begin to show up. I notice by just setting mm-hmm. that intention. I love what you said about the elixirs because I feel like when I put intention into what I'm doing and how I'm doing it and just literally saying, and, and intentions don't have to be a big thing. Like literally before I go into a social interaction, if I'm in the car, I'll just be like, my intention for this is blank. So going into entrepreneurship and work mm. and being like, my intention is to live in my divine feminine with a little sprinkle, sprinkle of some divine masculine coming in. And when I set the intention, (laughs) what I notice is I just am able to embody it. It's almost like my intention is me communicating with source Mm -hmm. and co-creating. It's really is this co-creation when I set an intention with the universe. It's like, okay, now you know what I want. I know what you want and let's do this together. And I don't have to think my way through it. I just embody it, you know? Mm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you make space for it. And I love how intentions are really commitments to making choices from the present rather than choices from our past conditioning, right? Because if we don't set a new intention, what are we really doing? We're just replaying how we've always been. And so anytime we're about to restart something and we set an intention, we kind of like interrupt that pattern and we say, me now, who I'm being right now, decides to do it like this. And so that's why the intention is so powerful. Um, So I love that you mentioned that. That's so beautiful. Mm -hmm. I love that you said that because I feel like it goes back to something that I said in the beginning where I was saying I'm making decisions from this like secure, fulfilled part of myself and Mm. not letting the insecure part of me make these decisions. The funny thing is I was going to say these big decisions, but actually when we were off the mic a second ago before my computer died, you said that there are no big decisions. They're all the same. And that actually, can you guys say something about that? Cause that was so impactful for me personally. I don't know if you say that a lot for your listeners, but I'm like, wow, that really stuck with me. Honestly, there, there is no big decisions. Cause when I look at where I live, who I choose to be as my partner. Like I think of those as big decisions for sure, but I love this reframe. Right. But what are you staking on them? Right. It's Mm -hmm. like, it's just, we stake so much onto them. We put such a big story onto them, but if we actually zoom out, we realize they're all just micro decisions. Right. And what's more important is who we're being when we make those decisions, not what we're actually projecting that those decisions will mean about us or secure for us in the future, because no decisions can secure anything in the future right? But that's what we believe, who I marry, right? Where I decide to live. This means something about the future. It doesn't actually mean anything about the future, right? Maybe that's not the person you're going to be married to in the future. Maybe that's not even where you're going to live in the future. And that's the thing is when you trust your own journey, you trust that wherever you get to, you will trust yourself to make a new decision if you need to. And so there's no need to put so much pressure on a quote unquote big decision, right? It's just what you're deciding for you right now. And then you get to basically discern whether it's still in alignment for you later. It's okay. There's no wrong decisions. There's just constant refinement and attunement to who you're really becoming. All right, Kayla, we're going to ask you our final question that we ask everyone and our spiralers always love to hear. And that question is, what is a common theme that has showed up in your life that you continue to spiral through? I think that common theme is that joy is the way. I think that play Mm. is the deepest expression of myself. Anyone that knows me knows that I'm just a little silly goose, truly. (laughs) And I really don't Mm. like to take (laughs) myself so seriously. I am so open to embarrassing myself in front of others. (laughs) What they would uh, consider embarrassing, I don't consider it embarrassing. And I feel like that's a common theme that has always come up for me is that when I feel like I'm living the most authentic expression of myself, it's when I'm in joy and in play and in nature 
and in flow state and in movement and all and all those aspects, which I guess you could say are inner child aspects, but I feel like they're just core human aspects that a lot of people forget how how vital that is to literally our survival, <laughs> our existence. And I think that's a common theme that I continue to spiral in is, you know, maybe having this part of myself that is really hard on myself. And then this other part of myself that's just like, no, we just want to like play and explore and be curious. And I think that's also a big theme that comes up for me is curiosity. Because when we are in stuckness and we begin to create those stories and and the meaning making around whatever state that we are currently experiencing, the best way to move through that for me personally is in curiosity and asking the questions that bring us to our truth like you guys were doing for me today. So I just want to first of all say thank you so much for I wrote so down so many questions of what we talked about because I was just <laughs> like I am looking forward to reflecting on this conversation on my own and I think curiosity leads to creation. So that's the current themes that I feel like I'm moving through oh, and always that. moving through. I think it's just a part of my personal journey and also something that I really, really want to share with the world is the power of curiosity, is the power of vulnerability in that. And also through that, just the joy and the play and the fun and not taking ourselves too seriously throughout the process. It just, I don't know, even like with all our technical difficulties right now, I love us just laughing our asses off about it. Cause I'm like, this isn't, it's not so serious. <laughs> like. Yes. And yeah. it gets to be playful. It gets to be playful. It gets to be fun. Oh my gosh. Thank, thank you. you so much, Kayla, for your energy, for your voice. And I will say one of the first things I noticed about you um, when I first came across your content was definitely this very playful, um, but just very honest energy that you just are so yourself. Mm -hmm. And so I know that everyone is going to get so much out of this. And um, yeah, we might have some more surprises for all of you if you're loving this collaboration. So stay tuned for all of that. But thank you so much for being here, Kayla. We will definitely have you back on in the future. I cannot wait. I love you both. And thank you guys are thank both you. just such brilliant beans, truly. Like little cute, brilliant beans. Like I just, whenever I talk to you guys, I <laughs> learn so much. And I feel like I go on a lot of other people's podcasts and it's like this pressure to be an expert at something. And I just loved that I got the opportunity mm -hmm. to like come on here today and really be myself. And for honestly, you guys to mentor me and to ask me the right questions, because I feel like that's what I've been calling in because I I am kind of like the healer friend for so many of my friends in my life. And then people come on to my show and then it's mm -hmm. like a therapy episode, you know, sometimes. And sometimes it's yes. just <laughs> nice to like have that in return at people asking you questions and being curious. And it just felt so amazing today to come on and be like, okay, like I don't have to be a certain way or talk a certain way or be like an expert in anything. Like I get to just be Kayla and be me. And I feel like you guys really gave myself permission to do that today. Thank you so much for listening to this honest conversation. We hope it brought you peace, clarity, and a little bit further along your spiritual journey. If you loved this episode, it would mean the world to us if you left us a five-star rating and a review so we can bring you more conscious conversations, spiritual topics, and guests. And we lovingly invite you to join our free Spiraling Higher community by clicking the link in the show notes to continue this healing dialogue and share with us how this episode impacted you. Come on in, introduce yourself, and meet your conscious besties in a safe space for healing conversations between us and other like-minded people on their healing journey. Here's to spiraling higher.